That's very, that's very typical of some of the brethren these days. <laughs> you can't have any split where everybody believes one authority. You know you have a split where there's two authorities. You husband and wives know about that? As long as there's one authority in the home, there can't be a split. You have a split where you have two. You'd think any fool could figure that out, wouldn't you? All right, you got a Bible tonight? I'll give the drawing away. The person will stand tonight and read. We'll do it this way tonight. By the way, that lady ever get that drawing this morning that bought those people? Did she get that drawing? Okay, I'll give a drawing away tonight. The person will stand and read. Make sure you got it open when you stand. Uh, Colossians 2.8. Colossians 2.8. Right there. Lay the yellow blouse. That's it. All right. Thank you. All right, now you've had enough, uh, you had enough milk for a while now. You've had some good devotional, spiritual preaching and enough to stir you up. And if you haven't been stirred up now, you've been here for four nights, haven't been stirred up, you're unstirrable. <laughs> <laughs> and so tonight we'll get into something a little bit heavier. And we'll talk tonight about, uh, uh, you know, if I had to start all over again and teach new converts things about the Word of God, I think one of the first things I'd teach them about would be the Trinity. And I know that's the old-fashioned way to do it, and maybe that's not too important thing right away. And yet, uh, the more I study the Bible, the more and more I see the problems you run into out in the ministry and false doctrine, the more and more I realize that the Trinity is a, a, a big thing in learning the Word of God. And the reason why it is is because everything breaks down into a Trinity. I read a book one time by a Lutheran uh, preacher, and it was called The Answer to Everything which is a pretty ambitious title, you know, for a book. <laughs> and with the answer to everything, you know what his thesis was? He said that uh, the fourth dimension was reality. He didn't go for this other dimension, total dimension, new dimension stuff. He said the fourth dimension is right now. You're in it. And the fourth dimension is a combination of three dimensions. And he said everything in the world breaks down to three dimensions. And he said, when you have to up against a problem and you can't find the thing to complete it, it's because you don't have three parts. And he said, since all the universe is an expression of God or a manifestation of God, and it's God's creation, then the whole universe has to manifest a trinity. I mean, God has a body, Jesus Christ. God has a soul, God the Father. God has a spirit, the Holy Spirit. If he made the thing, then it's a time and a space and matter continuum, you see. It's got three parts to it. And the time has past, present, and future. That's three parts. And the space has length, width, and breadth. That's three parts. There's no such thing as a line with two parts to it. If you've got two, you've got three, or it isn't there. There's no such thing as a line that has length and breadth, but no width. And breadth, but no width. If it has length and breadth, it's got width. You see, if I draw a line across here like this, you say, well, it's got length. And it's got, uh, you know, width of breadth, but no depth. It does, too. You can see it with a microscope. If the thing is there, it's got three parts to it. If it doesn't have three parts to it, it isn't there. <laughs> there's no such thing as being here with nothing behind you, nothing ahead of you. If you're here, there's something behind you, past. There's something here, present. There's something there, future. It all busts down into three. Now, you take a family. is a man and a woman and a child. You take that book, it's written in Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek. And you take that book in the New Testament, it's the Gospels, Gos uh, the Gospels and the Acts and the Epistles. And that Old Testament is the Law and the Writings and the Prophets. And over the other side, you've got Asia and Africa and Europe. On this side, you've got North America, Central America, and South America. And you're fighting in the air or the land or the sea and the army or the navy, see, or the air corps. And the first education is grade school, junior high school, high school will stop. And the next one is junior college, college, and post-grad. It'll bust down three every time you turn the thing around, no matter what it is. I mean, you got a body, you got a soul, you got a spirit. It's up, down, or in the middle. You're heavy, you're light, you're medium. You're short, you're tall, or you're in the middle. You can say yes or no or maybe. There are only three answers. <laughs> I mean, it's yes or no or maybe. Now, you bust a thing like down there, it'll come down to three every time you fool it. 
Now, you take your Bible and turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and look at verse 23 and notice, first of all, that a man has a body and a soul and a spirit. Now, do you ever stop thinking about what a, what a foolish thing it is for a bunch of people in the U.N., you know, the untied nuts or the united nuts or whatever they are, uh, or the usual nonsense, I guess. Here's a bunch of folks in the U.N. sitting down trying to figure out about man's problems and how to so solve man's problems, and they don't know what a man is. You go to a shrink downtown Rochester, give him try to help you. He's going to try to figure out your problems. How can he figure out what your problem is if he don't know what you are? You know what you are? Look at 1 Thessalonians 5.23. You're a body and a soul and a spirit, according to the Word of God. According to the Word of God, you're a body, and you're a soul, you're a spirit. Now, those words look like that in uh, Greek and Hebrew for body. For a soul, they look like this, psuche, or psyche, these modern Greeks will say. And you take a word like that, that's where they get psychology, psychiatry, psychosomatics, psychic, psychic research. They just steal words from the Bible to get those kind of things. And you take that thing there and... Hebrew looks like this, nephesh. Hebrew is right, right to left, right backwards. Watch well, you have a body, or else we write backwards. I never could figure out which it is. <laughs> and then that word for spirit in Greek looks like that. It's called pneuma, or pneumatos. You put it in the genitive singular. And that word looks like this in Hebrew. It's called ruach. Looks like that. Now, you don't have to know Hebrew or Greek to know that. I just put that up there so you can see they're not the same. There are some folks think the spirit's the soul and the soul of the spirit. That's impossible. They're not even spelled the same way. They're not the same word. You take that dumb Jehovah Witness, he thinks your body is your soul. He hasn't got a lick of sense. He thinks when your body goes into the grave, your soul goes into the grave with it. Turn to Genesis 35. Now, we're going to do a study tonight. You've got to put on your thinking cap tonight. You're going to work at it tonight. Entertainment's all over now. You're going to have to work. <laughs> Genesis 35, Genesis 35, verse 18. Genesis 35, verse 18. Now there Rachel is given birth, and she dies. And the Bible says it came to pass as her soul was in what? Departing, for she died. The soul doesn't go into the grave. The soul leaves the body before the grave gets there. See, it says, as she died, her soul was in departing. The body didn't depart. They buried the body. Paul, when he got ready to die, you know what he said? He said, the time of my departure is at hand. You take old Jacob back in the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 49. The Bible said he was there on the bed, and he gathered his feet up on the bed, and yielded up the ghost, and was gathered to his father's. Why, he wasn't buried till 50 days after that. Genesis 50. That fellow was gathered to his fathers, and then 50 days later they buried his body. Now, why would you think his soul went where his body went? His soul left 50 days before they did anything with his body. People sure have a time of it. All right, you've got a body, and you've got a soul, and you've got a spirit. Now, what are those things like? All right, there's the body. You can tell the body. The body is apparent. You can see the body. But what about that soul? What about that spirit? All right, there's a football. And there's the leather cover sitting there like that. That's the body. And then inside that leather cover, there's an inner tube. And it's shaped just like that outside, and that's the soul. And you fill it up with air, and you have one football. But it's three. But it's one. But it's three. Three and one, one and three, the one in the middle died for me. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. They're the same, but they're different. But they're exactly the same, but they're separate. <laughs> but they're the same. <laughs> now, you know, you said that's confusing, isn't it? I mean, Jesus one time was standing for a bunch of folks, and he said, He that has seen me has seen the Father. And boy, when he said that, all the oneness, holiness, Pentecostal, charismatic went out and just blew their top, man, and said, Jesus the Father, Jesus the Son, Jesus the Holy Ghost. That's a lie. Well, didn't he say, he that has seen me has seen the Father? Yes. Then Jesus the Father. No, he's not. 
When Christ was baptized, the Father was up there, and the Holy Spirit came out like a dove, and the Father said, This is my beloved Son, whom I am well pleased. Amen. See that thing? You say, well, then they're completely different. No, they're not. <laughs> Bible says back then, Isaiah, his name should be called the Everlasting Father. Amen. See the mess people get into? He stood there and said, He's seen me, he's seen the Father. Well, they're both identical. No, they're not. You know what he said? He said, no man has seen God at any time. And when he said that, the Jehovah Witness said, you see, there are two of them. <laughs> There's one God you can see and one God you can't see. And the new ASV is the Jehovah Witness Bible. And it says in John 1, 18, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten God, which is the bosom of the Father, he, the begotten God, hath declared him the unbegotten God. That's two gods. Count them. One, two. The new ASV recommended by Bob Jones is one of the worst heretical blasphemous Bibles ever put on the market. It's worse than the RSV. The RSV wouldn't think of making a statement like that. The only begotten God. Jesus Christ isn't a begotten God. Why, if he's a begotten God, then Mary is the mother of God. You better think about that, man. You say, well, what do you mean? Well, it's real simple. If you just, you know, sometimes common sense will get you through with the originals can't. <laughs> I mean, look at here. You see me? He that has seen me has seen Pete Rutten. True? No, I know word of truth in that. <laughs> I mean, no man has seen Pete Ruckman at any time. You see? Now, if you've seen me, you've seen all the Pete Ruckman there is to see, but you've never seen me. There isn't anybody in this building ever seen me a day in your life. You say, I'm looking right at you. No, you're not. You say, I can see you standing right there. No, you don't. You just, your eyes pulling tricks on you. <laughs> you know what you see? You see the body I walk around in. Amen? Yeah. See how folks are? They forget that they're not their bodies. You're not your body, you're in your body. This isn't me here. I'm in here looking out at you. <laughs> that's right, that's right. You know, when you, when, you, when, when you look at somebody's eyes, you come as close to seeing them as you'll ever see them. You look in their ears, you ain't gonna see nothing, you know. That, you know, that alimentary canal, outer eardrum, inner eardrum, earwax, and all that junk. And you look down the nose, you know, and sun, post-nasal drip, you know, and septum and all that junk. Look down the throat, adenoids, tonsillitis, tonsils, all that business. Now, you look in their eyes, and there's something in there looking at you. Did you ever wonder why an optometrist would make such good pastors? I mean, you're not going to get all the answers in college. You're not even going to get all the questions. Have you ever noticed how most optometrists can remember your name better than any other kind of a doctor? You think I'm just talking? Why don't you check them out? Did you know optometrists are famous for knowing details about people's lives that other doctors forget? You know why that is? That little boy's got that light up there all his life looking right straight at that thing with that eyeball. And there's something there looking back. When that fellow dies, the first thing you look at, they look at his eyes. See? Something left. All right, you have a body, you have a soul, you have a spirit. Jesus Christ is God's body. The Father is the soul, the Holy Spirit the spirit. No man has seen God at any time. He that has seen me has seen the Father. Christ is baptized. When he goes down the water, the Holy Spirit descends like a dove, and a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, whom I am well pleased. The Trinity is not a Catholic doctrine. It's not a Baptist doctrine. It's a Bible doctrine. He said, Go baptize him in the name of the Father, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Is his name Jesus? No. He's the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Truth, the Paraclete, the Comforter. Is his name Jehovah? No. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus Christ. His name is the Lord Jesus Christ. His name is Emmanuel. His name is Jehovah, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Sidkenu, Jehovah Rapha, and a bunch of other Jehovahs. All kinds of names. They're separate. But they're the same. <laughs> it isn't the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. There's no descendants in order. It's the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. All right, now, the body is apparent. The spirit's apparent. 
by a parent, take your Bible and turn to John chapter 3 and see what it means. Get John 3 in one hand and get uh, Ezekiel 37 in the other. John 3 and Ezekiel 37. Let's see what the Spirit is. Now, there's something in the Greek word that I'll tell you what it is, because when that Greek word starts out, it starts out pneuma. See? Now, if it starts out like that, you'll know what it's going to be. Any of you fellows ever run a pneumatic drill? Did you ever have pneumonia? Pneumonia? <laughs> if you have pneumonia, you have trouble with your wind. If you have a pneumatic drill, you've got an air-driven, compressed air driving that thing. Why don't you take John chapter 3, look at verse 8, Christ talking. The wind bloweth where it listeth, thou hearest the sound thereof, but cannot tell from whence it cometh, nor whither it goeth, so is every one that is born of the Spirit. The Spirit then is like wind, like air. Take your Bible and turn to uh, Ezekiel chapter 37. And Ezekiel chapter 37, look at verse 9, look at verse 14. Ezekiel 37, verse 9, verse 14. That's a prophecy. And he tells old Ezekiel to prophesy to the four winds and say, Come, O breath, breathe upon these slain. And he, he prophesies the four winds and says, Breathe upon these slain. And the Spirit came in them. They took upon, stood upon their feet and became a great army. Now notice that thing there, that wind, that breath he prophesies to is identified as the Spirit, verse 14. Verse 14. So the Spirit is like wind to air. Now, every one of you in this building, if you're a human being, I suppose you are, sometimes you wonder, though, when you walk around downtown, you know, you think there must be people from outer space because all those things couldn't be ours. <laughs> and, and you people in this building all have one spirit. That's called the spirit of man. Every dog, cat, rattlesnake, skunk, and deer in this county has the same spirit. That's the spirit of a beast. Solomon says, Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward, and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward of the earth? Who knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even no man, so no man knoweth the things of God, save the spirit of God. There are four of them. Spirit of a beast, spirit of a man, spirit of God. There's one more, the spirit of the devil. Now those are the four spirits in the world. There isn't any psychiatrist or scientist that knows that, so just discard all both bunches without even giving them a second thought. There are four spirits, winds, in the air. There are unclean spirits from the devil, the Holy Spirit from the Lord, the beasts are in the animals, the human spirits the man. When I open my mouth and something comes out of my mouth, breath comes out of my mouth. When I speak, I minister. And when I minister, I minister one of three spirits. If what comes out of my mouth is an unclean spirit, it's from the devil. And if what comes out of my mouth is human, it's flesh, it's the spirit of man. And if what comes out of my mouth from the Lord, it's the Holy Spirit. And there isn't a charismatic that knows that one either. That Bible is the most radical book you ever got your hands on all your life. Paul said, he that ministers the Spirit to you. Does he do it by the works of the law, by the hearing of, of faith? When a man preaches, something takes place. I don't know what it is, but I know it takes place. You wouldn't be here tonight if it didn't take place. Do you ever stop thinking what a stupid thing it is for you to sit here and listen to a fellow get up here and just beat his gums? Do you ever stop thinking how stupid that is? Can't you use your time better than that? What could be more foolish than a whole bunch of people just sitting watching a guy and he's up there going, ah, blah, 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 blah. You know what the Bible says? The Bible said it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Paul says we're fools for Christ's sake. Brother, uh, Mother's talking about paying twenty dollars to go see that thing and comparing that with things. My kids pull out on me all the time. I got three boys, they're all over six feet tall. They're all blocks off the old chip. <laughs> they're six one and six feet and six feet two. And those guys all got basketball scholarship, baseball scholarship, football scholarship, all that stuff. Then all that sports stuff, you know. One of my boys said to me one year, he said, Well, Dad, wouldn't you pay $50 to go to get a 50-yard line and see at the Super Bowl? I said, Nah, man. I, well, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go out there if you gave it to me. I mean, the trouble getting in the parking lot wouldn't be worth the time or getting out. <laughs> and he said, Yeah, but what if it was right in the same town? I said, I wouldn't go. I said, If Jack Hiles and Lester Roloff were pre preaching in one building, Bob Gray and Jack Hiles and Lester Roloff, and the Super Bowl was two blocks away, I'd go hear Hiles and Roloff and Gray. And he said, oh, now, Dad. I said, yeah, really. Oh, you're Dad. You don't I said, really? And they said, why? I don't know why. 
I just know something happens when a man preaches who's prayed up and preaching the truth that doesn't happen out of Super Bowl. I don't know what it is, but it's a transaction that takes place. All right, you got a body, you got a spirit. What's the spirit like? It's like wind. Look at here. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Then if you're unsaved, you have a dead spirit. If you're in this building at night, you're unsaved, there's any religion in the world can do anything for you because you have a dead spirit. Nothing can give you. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not thy city, ye must be born again. If you're sitting here at night, you're unsaved, you have a live body and a live soul and a dead spirit. Now, how do you know you got a dead spirit? Because the Lord told old Adam, and the day that you eat of that fruit there, you're going to die. I know what Garner Ted Armstrong says. He hadn't got a lick of sense either. Amen. Goes around and says, well, it was physical death 500 years later. No, it wasn't. It was spiritual death. How do you know? Because the Bible says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. You better turn to it. Ephesians 2, turn to it. Before a man is saved, he's dead. Now, you can walk and eat and sleep and reproduce just like an animal and still be dead. Isn't that complimentary? I wonder how that would go in the First Presbyterian Church next Sunday morning. <laughs> Ephesians 2, verse 1. Read it. Ephesians 2, verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespass and trespassed in the sin. See that thing? Look at that thing there. Being dead in your sins hath he quickened together. Verse 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Ephesians 2, verse 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Give you time to read it there. Some of you folks mess around in some of these uh, big churches that have such a reputation for being so Christian and so orthodox. When was the last time your preacher told you you were a dead man without Christ? Does your preacher point his finger at his congregation, tell all the doctors and lawyers they're dead? There are a bunch of stinking corpses walking around, getting mad, reproducing like a pack of barnyard animals, and they're dead. You know what Jesus said? He said, let the dead bury the dead. You know what Paul said? She that liveth in pleasure is dead while she yet liveth. If you're not a saved man, you're dead spiritually. You're a walking corpse. You're a zombie. Paul. I mean, do you think that book could ever be popular? <laughs> If you find a book that's popular, there's something wrong with it. But like a fellow said, reading the living Bible is kind of like shaving with a banana. <laughs> <laughs> All right, dead. Now that part is when. All right, what's your soul like? What's your soul like? Your soul is a bodily shape. B.R. Theme says in his book on the blood, he says, don't forget the soul is located in the cranium. It is on a pig's eye. <laughs> Take your Bible and turn to Revelation chapter 6. And get that in one hand, get Revelation chapter... You say, why do you talk like that? To shock you folks, to upset you, make you nervous, make you mad, make you think. You're asleep. Wake up. <laughs> All right, Ephesians chapter 6. Or rather, uh, what did I say? Revelation 6. Revelation 6. It's hard to keep your mind four things at once. Ephesians... Or, Revelation chapter 6 and Revelation chapter 20. I want Revelation 20 verse 4 and Revelation 6 about uh, all verse uh, 9. Revelation 6, 9, Revelation 20 verse 4. Do you know that thousands of fundamentalists talk about soul winning, soul winning, winning souls, and don't even know what a soul is? Systematic theology, Burkhoff, he doesn't have any idea what a soul is. Systematic theology, Lewis Perry Schaefer, he doesn't know what in the world he's talking about. Folks say, Ruckman, who do you think you are? I'm a Bible believer. When I read in there what a soul is, I believe it. I don't mess with it. Revelation 20, verse 4. I saw the souls of them were beheaded. Saw the souls. You can see a soul. Them beheaded. And they, what, did they sit on thrones? A soul can sit down on something. Take your Bible, turn to Revelation chapter 6, and look at verse 9. And I saw unto the altar the souls, under the altar, 
And the souls under the altar cried with a loud voice. A soul has a mouth. And said, O Lord, holy and true, how long dost thou not judge us or avenge our blood upon them that dwell upon the face of the earth? And white robes were given to them. Well, a soul can wear a white robe. It has a bodily shape. Why, if the soul came to that door right now in a fine linen robe, it'd be a white sheet. And if you took off the white sheet, there'd be nothing there. So consequently, every movie you ever saw had a ghost in it. He had a white sheet over him. I catch up with the King James Bible once in a while, but not often. But not often. Now, what's a soul? A soul is a bodily shape. You doubt it? Turn to Luke 16. Luke 16. Some of you don't look convinced at all. Turn to Luke 16. Turn to Luke 16. Mouth of two or three witnesses will give you one more. Luke 16, 24. Luke 16, 24. Rich man's in hell. Luke 16, 24. Luke 16, 24. And in hell, he lift up his what? What? Eyes. Say it again. Eyes. A soul has eyes. You understand that? And said, Abraham, Father Abraham, have mercy upon me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my what? My what? A soul has a tongue. The very idea of saying the soul is located in the cranium. The soul is a bodily shape. Bible said in hell we're going to be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. An old colored sister said, well, I ain't going to worry about that, preacher, because I done lost all my teeth. <laughs> and he said, madam, teeth will be provided. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of truth in that, brother. Now, you see inside this body here, I got another one shaped just like this one inside here. I'm in a Rosicrucian could get that, or even a Buddhist. It's like some dumb fundamentalist couldn't figure that out. If I got a hand cut off a couple of months later, I'd say to my wife, my fingers itch. And she'd say, well, your fingers couldn't itch. You don't have any hand. I'd say, yeah, but they itch. And I'd go to the doctor and say, what's the matter? And he'd say, well, it's the nerve endings. No, it's not. I got a hand there. You know why, you, you know why a fellow when he, you know when a fellow when he dies and goes to hell, you know why he can burn without burning up? Because he has a body that can't burn up. You just read it. The rich man in hell had a tongue and he had eyes. They weren't burnt up. You got a body inside this body. There's a natural body. There's a spiritual body. It'd never burn up. You'll burn forever. You got a body just like this one. You got a body, you got a soul, you got a spirit. See that football, the leather, that's the body. See that inner tube, that's the soul. See that air in there, that's the spirit. That's one football. But it's three of them. But it's one of them. You know what an unsaved man is? He's a flat tire. <laughs> that's right, that's right, that's right. That's right. He's got a tire and an inner tube and no air. All right, now, that's the introduction. Now, here's the message. Now, back there in the Garden of Eden, uh, there was a man back there. And the Lord said, let's take that man, make that man in our image. And he made in the image of God. Male and female created he them and called their name Adam. He didn't call them Adam and Eve. He called them Adam. And that's why you have your husband's name, your father's name. And then when he made that man, he didn't put any blood in him. Folks say, what new doctrine is this? This is the old outdated, outmoded, archaic Elizabethan English that nobody can understand, that covers up the true meaning of the Word of God, which you can't understand unless you have access to the latest scientific resources. <laughs> Genesis 2. Now read it. Read it. Genesis 2. There's no cure for ignorance like reading the Bible. Genesis 2, 23. Genesis 2, 23. God made the woman out of the man's rib and brought her to him, and he said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. You seen there about blood? There ain't blood there. He just mentions flesh and bones. You said accidental. It is. Turn to Luke 24. 
Let's look at the second Adam. The last Adam comes up in the dead in Luke 24, and when he comes up in the resurrection body, let's see what kind of a body he has. Luke 24. And pick up Luke 24, and Luke 24, look at verse 39. Luke. Oh, that's a beautiful sound. You can't hear her down there like I can hear up here. When you say, turn to Luke 24, 39, you hear, that's a beautiful sound, man. I'm, I don't have to worry about you folks getting neo-orthodox. <laughs> Any church, you know, where they shout and say amen and run up down the benches, you never have to worry about it getting neo-orthodox. <laughs> All right, now you take uh, Luke 24 there along about verse 39. He comes up from the dead, and he says to those disciples, touch me, handle me, and see that as I myself, for a spirit, hath not flesh and bones, as you see me have. He didn't have a drop of blood in him. His blood was gone. Turn to 1 Corinthians 15. Try hit it again if you're not convinced. Just keep at it. 1 Corinthians 15, 49 to 50. You know what the interpreter of Scripture is? It's the Scripture. You know what gives light on the Scripture? The Scripture. No prophecy of any private interpretation. No man can tell you what it means. God Almighty will tell you what he means. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 49, verse 50. 1 Corinthians 15, 49, verse 50. Now this I say unto you, brethren, flesh and blood. See, when the Lord wants to say blood, he'll put it in. Flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now flesh and bones can. When Christ rose from the dead, he had a combination of flesh and bones, a glorified body, and when he shall appear, we shall be like him. The Bible says we shall change our vile body and fashion like according to his glorious body. We'll have a body with no blood in it because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Why? What's wrong? There's something wrong with your blood. Your problem's a blood problem. Something wrong with your seed. The Bible says back here in Deuteronomy, they drank the pure blood of the grape. That's a strange business. Now you take Adam, for he fell, he didn't have any blood in him. What did he have in him? I don't know what he had in him. He must have had some kind of circulatory system because he kept on living after he took the thing, you know, and, but his circulatory system changed. You say, well, could you take some orally that would affect your circulatory system? Well, maybe not directly, but they say you are what you eat. They say that today. Eventually what you eat gets strained through and comes out in the blood. You know the trouble most folks have? It's blood trouble. I'm no, I'm no medical doctor, you know. I'm a doctor. A doctor, all he has to do is be able to diagnose a case and prescribe a remedy. How many of you know what the trouble with the world is? Let me see your hands. There you go. How many know the remedy? Let me give you a degree tonight. <laughs> That's what a doctor is. A doctor should be able to diagnose the case, prescribe a remedy. You know what the trouble is? It's sin. You know what the remedy is? It's Jesus Christ. Well, get your doctor. <clears throat> anyway, when I go up and down the hospitals, you know what I see? I see most of the trouble is blood trouble. Leukemia. It's blood. Hodgkin's disease. It's blood trouble. Bright's disease. It's blood trouble. Heart trouble. It's blood trouble. Artocellarosis, whatever it is, or... Of hardening the arteries, blood trouble, phlebitis, blood trouble. It's blood trouble. Something wrong with your blood. You know what he had in them, hit him there before that thing went to pieces? If you believe the book, he had water. Did you ever even talk about a blue blood? I mean, blue blood's royalty. Blue blood comes from the king. You know what the first public miracle is in the Old Testament? It's a fellow turning water to blood. You know what the first public miracle is in the New Testament? It's Christ turning water to wine, John chapter 2. What's the wine type of? Type of blood. You know what he says back here in 1 John chapter 5? And the Spirit, and the water, and the blood. Bear witness. These three are one. So they took out the next verse in the New Bibles. All right, he has a circulatory system here, this water, and then something happens. He takes something orally, and what he takes orally fixes that bloodstream. Something goes wrong. 
and inside he dies spiritually. And whatever he gets in there fixes him so that all his seed is no good. And your granddaddy died because his blood was no good, and you're going to die because your blood's no good, and your children are going to die because their blood's no good, and there isn't anything scientists has ever done about it or ever will do about it. Because the blood is no good. People die because there's something wrong with the blood. The ground you eat is cursed. God cursed the ground. You put it in your mouth, it goes in your bloodstream. If you had perfect blood when you started, you wouldn't have it when you finished. Something wrong with your blood. I mean, the best blood in the world sometimes flows in the veins of a fool. A mosquito, he in particular, who he gets his blood from, I wonder who's just good as another man. It's all the same thing. The, God, the Bible says God hath made of one blood all nations that dwell upon the face of the earth, and the one blood's no good. Adam takes that, and the lights go out. And the lights go out, and he finds himself in the unenviable position of a man whose soul is stuck to his body. and stuck so tight that what happens to one happens to the other until he dies and his soul doesn't get out till he's dead. And they're stuck so close together that every Jehovah Witness in this town thinks they're the same. You know where he got his stuff from? I'll show you. Turn to Leviticus 22 in one hand and Numbers chapter 31 in the other. Every heresy has a Bible basis. Every heresy can quote scripture. Numbers 31, Leviticus 22. Now look at Leviticus 22. Leviticus 22, verse 6 and verse 11. Now see that thing? Read it. Leviticus 22, verse 6 and verse 11. If a soul touch any unclean thing, eat any unclean thing, See, that there, the soul is spoken of as synonymous with the body. If the soul touch anything, see? That old soul is joined up that flesh, so when that flesh touches that thing, the soul touches it. That's why that dumb Jehovah Witness thought when they buried the body, the soul went down in the tomb. Because they are together while the fellow's alive, but they leave when he dies. Now you turn to Numbers 31. And Numbers 31, I want to have you look at verse 28. And Numbers 31, verse 28, notice that there even animals are spoken of as souls. Numbers 31. Numbers 31, verse 28. One something, one soul of every 50 of bees, asses, camels, sheep, all that stuff. And they're spoken of that. Why? Because that animal evidently has in, within him a bodily shape. It's not a living soul. It's not like a man's soul. God breathed in a man and not the breath of life, and man became a living soul. That thing there is just animal life. And because of that, the Jehovah Witness says, you see, their animal life is just physical life. Therefore, when you're dead physically, then you're dead spiritually, and you're unconscious. No, you're not. Your soul leaves your body when you die. Now, in the Old Testament, that soul was stuck to that body. When Lot ran out of Sodom, you know what he said? He said, let me get there to that city, Zoar. I can't get to the mountain. Let me to escape that city. It is but a little one, and my soul will live. Those old-time saints used to say, as my soul liveth, I'm going to do this and that. The soul is synonymous with the body in the Old Testament because it's stuck together. Listen. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. That is in Ezekiel. And that whole chapter is on physical death. The fellow dying physically. And that's where J.W. gets that stuff from. Now, we'll see where he made a mistake here in a minute. But you get over there in Genesis chapter 17, and up shows a man named Abraham. And in Genesis 17, when Abraham shows up, the Lord says, get your knife. And he said, what for? And the Lord said, well, I have to do some cutting. And he said, where? And he said, where it hurts the most. <laughs> And he said, the trouble with you, Abraham, is your seed. There's something wrong with your seed. Got to get cut, circumcised. Your seed's unclean. The reason why people die if they all come from Adam. Adam's seed is no good. And cut yourself, get circumcised. What's that a picture of? 
That's a picture of a time when God's going to reach inside a fellow's body and cut his soul loose from his body. You where to get that from? Turn to it, Colossians chapter 2 in the New Testament. Colossians chapter 2 in the New Testament. Now we've gone far beyond the original manuscripts. They have nothing to contribute at this stage. <laughs> All right, Colossians chapter 2, folks say, well, they're in there. If they're in there, why couldn't they find it? I get sick and tired of these fellows saying, well, the Greek and the Hebrew are superior, and then you show them something they missed, and they said, well, it was in there. We just didn't see it. Why didn't you see it, stupid? <laughs> you must have been messing with the wrong text. All right, Colossians chapter 2, and look down that line there, along about verse uh, 10 someplace. Make it, make it 11, and 11, 12, and 13 along in there. Colossians 2, 11, 12, 13. You're buried with him in baptism through faith, the operation of God, operation, operation, operation. See that? You get that knife and cut down at the hospital. You know what they call down at the hospital? They call it an operation. I mean, the King James tells them how to behave, and they behave. And then you come on down there. It says, putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. What verse is that? 11. Putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. What's the circumcision? It's an operation. And when God got saved, he took a knife that is quick and powerful and sharp, for any two-edged sword, and ran it down into your skin, and <laughs> you talk about an operation, he cut you loose from that body. Ain't that wild? <laughs> I bet when some of you got saved, you didn't know that. Boy, I sure didn't know it. When I got saved, all I knew I was going to hell if something didn't happen pretty quick, and if something didn't happen pretty quick, I was going to make it. That's all I knew. All I knew, I was going to hell. I never forget when I got saved, got reading the Bible, and found out what happened, I could hardly even believe it. Now you take this thing right, he says, Abraham, he says, cut yourself. He's cut himself where? Well, cut yourself where the seed is. There's something wrong with your seed. Abraham wasn't born again. There isn't any new birth. Take your Bible and turn to Genesis chapter 5. There isn't any new birth anywhere in the Old Testament. Folks say, Ruckman teaching the heresy is saying folks are saved different in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Why, of course they are. They're not even the same after they're saved. Genesis chapter 5. Genesis chapter 5. David wasn't in the, made in the image of God. Hezekiah wasn't made in the image of God. Jehoshaphat wasn't made in the image of God. Look at Genesis chapter 5. This is the book of the generations of Adam. I right, come on down there, verse 1, 2, and 3. And he begat a son. What verse is that? In his own likeness, after his own... 3, see verse 3. In his own image, after his own likeness. Every man on this earth, from Adam to Jesus Christ, including John the Baptist, was born and died dead in trespasses and sins. There wasn't one of them spiritually circumcised. There wasn't one of them regenerated. There wasn't one of them adopted. There wasn't one of them in Christ. There wasn't one of them was part of Christ. There wasn't a single one of them was saved just like you're saved. And so when they died, they didn't even go to heaven. They went to paradise to Abraham's bosom. You couldn't make them the same if you tried. Abraham was saved. I grant you was saved by grace through faith. He wasn't saved through grace, by grace through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. That fellow was saved by grace through faith and believing God gave him a whole lot of children. People have a time of it. You go off to school and the professor stands up there and he says, they were saved in the Old Testament exactly as they were in the New. In the Old Testament, they're looking forward to Calvary. In the New Testament, they're looking back to Calvary. That makes a great spiritual nugget, but there just isn't any truth in it. <laughs> I mean, when God saved Noah, he said, Now, Noah, look forward to Calvary. He said, Hey, son, build your boat. <laughs> you know how a fellow is saved? He's saved by doing what God tells him to do to get saved. The folks at Pentecost, Peter didn't get up and say, Thus saith the Lord. Repent, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. He didn't say that. You know why? He didn't know that. What he told them was, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Listen, I'm, I'm on a level with you. You could repent till you blue in the face and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ every day of your life and go to hell just like a bullet. There isn't anybody... 
anybody in Rochester that was ever saved by repenting and being baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ because that is what God told you to do to get saved. He said, what did he tell you? He said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. You're not a Pentecostal Jew back there before the New Testament is written. You're a Gentile over here in America after the whole thing is completed. The Lord changes. Call Abraham out. Say, Abraham, uh, step out. So I won't talk to you a minute. Got there, look up in the air. The Lord said, you see all those stars? Yep. I'm going to give you that many children. Good. <laughs> What? <laughs> Good, that's great. I'd like to have that many children. Lord said, look here, let's be reasonable, man. You're only 100 years old. And he said, well, you just said you're going to have that many children, didn't you? Yeah, I didn't expect you to believe it. <laughs> well, Lord, if you say it, I believe it. And Lord said, do you mean to tell me you think that I give a 100-year-old man with a 90-year-old wife that many children? Well, if you say it, I believe it. Lord says, okay, if you're wild enough to do that, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll just give you my righteousness. And Paul said in Romans 4 that righteousness was not imputed to Abraham when he believed anything about the cross. It was imputed to him when he believed what God told him about his children. Amen. One day, Lord brought me up on a hill and said, see that dead Jew up there, the blood running off him? Yeah, that's how you get to heaven. Lord said, you're kidding he said, well, you said it, I believe it. Lord says, how can anybody be dumb to believe that a dead Jew could get a fellow to heaven? Well, I said, I don't know, but if you said it, I believe it. And the Lord said, well, if you're wild enough to do that, I'll tell you, I'll do, I'll just give you my righteousness. <laughs> and I got it. I got it. I got it. <laughs> you know, the Lord got all kinds of ways of making fools out of folks. You wouldn't think a fellow get to heaven by just trusting what a dead Jew did, would you? That's how you get there. Amen. Amen. Salvation is of the Jews. You better have me too anti-Semitic. You're liable to miss it, man. <laughs> All right. He said, cut yourself. So he cuts himself. Is he spiritually circumcised? No. That's why he's physically circumcised. Because God couldn't spiritually circumcise him. The promised seed hadn't come. The promised seed hadn't died. The promised seed hadn't come up from the dead. He couldn't indwell a fellow's body. Holy Spirit coming to fill in the Old Testament. He touched a dead body. <whistles> Holy Spirit leave. I go down the priest, off of this, off of this. Holy Spirit come back. Fellow go along and take something he's supposed to wash seven times. Only wash it five times. <whistles> Holy Spirit leaves. Aren't you glad you're not in the Old Testament? Amen. You know what happened to Saul? The Holy Spirit left him and never came back. You know what happened to Samson? The Holy Spirit left him and came back. You don't have to David. The Holy Spirit should have left him and didn't. Now let's see you figure that out. You can't get a New Testament plan of salvation in the Old Testament. David said, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. And the Lord didn't. Saul didn't pray that and the Lord did. I sure am glad I'm out of the Old Testament. Listen, the, Lord, the Holy Spirit is in me and I am sealed to the day of redemption. Why? Because I'm cut loose. Look at here. See this? ice tray, and these are cubes in it, and the handle to break it with, and they're all stuck to the tray on all four sides, each cube, and you put that thing under hot water, and then crack that thing, and those things come loose, and they're still in the tray, but they're not stuck to the tray. You know how you get victory over sin? By grabbing that thing I just told you. You're in the body, but you're not stuck to the body. Paul says, though we walk in the flesh, okay, I'm still stuck with this mess. Though you walk in the flesh, we don't war after the flesh. Then he said, you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be the spirit of Christ dwell in you. I'm in the flesh, but I'm not in the flesh. I'm in the flesh geographically. You want to locate me? I'm up here, stuck in the flesh. Spiritually, I'm in Christ. He that is joined to the Lord is one in spirit. You've got to get that. You know why that's so very important? Because that'll prevent this church from ever becoming hyper-Calvinist. Every saint in the Old Testament was dead in trespass and sin and got saved anyway. Let's see if you figure that out. Turn to Exodus 35. You know what John Calvin said? 
He said, you can't receive Christ till you're quickened. John Calvin said, you're dead, and unless the Holy Spirit quickens you, you can't receive Christ. That's what those old Calvinists were teaching. They were teaching irresistible grace had to give you the new birth before you could repent and trust Christ. Boy, boy, you talk about a screwed up mess. You turn to Exodus 35. There isn't one man in that chapter that's quickened. There isn't one man in that chapter that's born again. There isn't one man in that chapter that's in Christ. And look at the verses. I'm going to give you time to read them. Read verse 10, 21, 22, and 25. 10, 21, 22, and 25. Give you time to read them. Verse 10, 21, 22, 25. Now read that thing. Boy, you talk about free will. Any unsaved man can do what God tells him to do if he wants to. The Lord told those people what to do and they did it. And none of them were born again. And none of them were quickened. They were all dead and trespassed in sin. They were all stuck to their bodies. Verse 21, 22, 25. The Holy Spirit never touched them. Their own spirit stirred them up. All this cockeyed stuff, these theologians, if they can't get their bog down the mud, hubcap, hide to a Ferris wheel, you never saw it. You take old John Calvin, those fellows, like Pastor Robinson of the Mayflower said, he said John Calvin was a precious shining light in his day, and he was. For a fellow just coming out of a thousand years of Catholicism, Calvin did a pretty good job. But you folks ain't got no alibi. Time you put the kiddies playthings behind man. Nobody, nobody in the Old Testament is quickened. None of them are chosen in Christ. They don't even get in Christ. And God tells them to repent and they repent. And God tells them to believe and they believe. And God tells them to give and they give. You sit there and act like you don't have power to do what God tells you to do. This old hard shell Baptist sitting around saying, well, the Spirit just ain't drawing me yet. <laughs> Christ said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men. All this stuff. Nothing will kill a church any quicker than Calvinism. Yeah. Kill any deader, just deader than a hammer man. What is to be shall be, whether it is or not, you know. That kind of business. Some of you folks, uh, you haven't had too much of that, and I, I'm glad you haven't. My favorite story is two hard shell Baptists coming out of a church in Kentucky and they slip on the ice. And when they get up, one of them turns to the other one and says, well, thank God that's over with. <laughs> <laughs> that isn't funny unless you understand predestination. But you get to a place where you think that everything is predestinated. And it's not. The Lord's very tricky. The Lord has a way of just giving you a slack line and just let you take it any way you want to, and as soon as you do, he adjusts himself to what you just did. He's very tricky. All right, now you take this thing here. Nobody from there to there is quickened. None of them have live spirits. The spirits are dead. They die. They don't go to heaven. They go to paradise, Abraham's bosom. All right, now here comes eternal life. I bet you never saw a picture of eternal life before. Here it comes. See it? Here it comes. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I just throw it coming out of here. It doesn't have any beginning. So I just throw it come in like it always been there because it's always been there. Of course, you can't understand that. I mean, blow your mind, man. You can't, you can't grasp. Did you ever get out in the hillside at night and just try to figure eternity or even figure God? You don't drive you up the wall, man. You lie there and figure, well, now there are all those stars out there. And what's outside of that? You know, of the universe. Well, it goes way out there to where? Well, to God. Well, God's outside of it. Well, if he's outside of it, what's outside of him? Well, nothing. Well, how could there be nothing outside of nothing? <laughs> and you get going that thing, your mind can't even comprehend the immensity of God, let alone eternity. How can you figure a being that has always been out there? Always, man. No beginning, no end. Moses said, what's your name? And he said, I am. He didn't even say I was. I am. 
fine. He's just been running all the time. <laughs> I'll get back in this minute, but did you ever stop thinking what it would be like? <laughs> did you ever stop thinking what it would be like to get to heaven and then grasp that? Do you know why all they do in heaven is just run around and scream and holler and yell and throw crowns around and roar? You know what? Because they grasp that. Boy, wait till you get to the place where your mind comprehends this being that has just always been there just because he's been there. And you grab that thing, see, <laughs> and then suddenly realize you're part of him and now have his nature. Listen, some of you Baptists never shout. You are going to hit the ceiling of New Jerusalem, brother. Yeah. I'll tell you, you're going to go, Whoa! and take off there. That jet stream from you will push you to Jupiter and back, boy, in about two minutes. Will you grab that thing, boy? Will you get up there and suddenly realize you're plugged into a system where there's no entropy <laughs> and there's no dissipation of energy? And it's just up at top level all the way forever. Wait till you get that, boy. You do some shouting. You do some bass running. <laughs> all right, here comes eternal life. And eternal life comes along here like this. And then it goes down here like this. And it goes through here like this. And it comes up here like this and goes right on like this. Now, somewhere when that eternal life comes down, there's a break. And that breaks right there. That's where the cross comes. And he says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I don't understand that. I don't see how eternal life could quit if it's eternal. But I know this. I know if it's eternal life, I know if there's one break in it anywhere, at that break, whoever is there is in eternal death. Christ doesn't have to hang on that cross forever. Three hours take care of it just fine. And he's hanging up there. I guess if he didn't have six parts to him, you couldn't even bring the thing through. But there's that one hanging on the cross. You thought to talk about theology, man. That's God, the Father, manifest in the flesh. That's one nature. That's God, the Son, God's body, second nature. That's the fullness of the Godhead bodily, the Holy Spirit, third nature. That's a human body. It gets thirsty. It gets hungry. It gets tired. It weeps. There's the fourth nature. My soul is sorrowful even to death. There's the fifth nature. His spirit was grieved within him. There's the sixth one. You're dealing with six of them. You get in there, boy. You're, you're getting there where the theologians can't keep up. I know one thing. He dies in my place, and he's buried, and he comes up from the dead. Low in the grave he lay, Jesus my Savior, waiting the coming day, Jesus my Lord. Up from the grave he rose, the mighty triumph for his foes. I heard, I heard old color preacher preaching that down in South one time. Boy, I'll tell you, that was an impressive way to put it, boy. He really had it down. You know what he said? He said, the devil got a hold of Jesus, and he said he turned him over to death. And he said, hey, death, keep him down there. Don't let him get away. And death said, I got him. When I got him, they got him. Devil said, good. <laughs> and he said, about a day later, the devil came back and said, hey, you still got it? And death said, I got him. I got him. Don't worry about him. I got him. <laughs> and Day later, the devil came around and said, hey, he's still down there. Yeah, he's down there. I got him. Go on. Don't worry about it. Next day, the devil came around and said, just check. Is he still down there? Yeah, I got him, and I got him. Day got good. <laughs> All right. And the fourth day, came around there and said, hey, death. Hey, death. Death. <laughs> and death said, what do you want? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, you still got him? And death said, mm-mm, something going wrong around here. <laughs> <laughs> the best news this world ever got, it got from a graveyard. Yeah. Came out of a graveyard. All right, now, step over here. I'm going to take a man this side of Calvary and watch him get saved. I don't know any other example to use except myself. It's the best one I know and I'm familiar with. I mean, after all, you know, really, the only three people in the world know you're saved anyway. I tell you I'm saved. You believe me, you know. You tell me you're saved. I believe you, but I don't know. You don't know about me for sure. I mean, uh, you hope I'm not lying to you. I hope you're not lying to me. <laughs> but you know, the only three people know I'm saved. One of those is me. And one of them's the Lord, and one of them's the devil. Now, the devil knows I'm saved. He don't appreciate it a bit. <laughs> and I know I'm saved, and the Lord knows I'm saved. 
I was in a record room of a radio station in 1949 after World War II, drinking myself to death. No family, alone in the world without hope and without God, making my money as a radio disc jockey. And the 14th of March, 1949, at 10 o'clock in the morning, a Baptist preacher came in there and took me back in the record room of the radio station. He came in there and I said, uh, Hi, preacher, what do you know? And he said, I know the Lord Jesus Christ. What do you know? And I said, I don't know him. He said, would you like to know him? And I said, sure. And he said, what you waiting for? Which seemed to me kind of peculiar, you know, because I've been trying to get saved for months. And I was, you know, tit-tat-toe, three in a row, Hail Mary full of grapes and all that stuff, and <laughs> taking the, and taking the, the, you know, the palm leaf home and putting it up there in the thing Sunday, you know, and ashes in your forehead, ash Friday, and ash Wednesday, you know, and uh, Monday, Thursday, and Tennessee Saturday night and all that business. <laughs> And, and I've been trying for months to get saved, and that guy said, what you waiting for? And I said, I don't know. He took me back in the rec room, took out a New Testament. He said, you believe this, the Word of God? Good old King James 1611. I said, yep, that's it. He said, you believe you're a sinner? I said, yeah, I know I'm a sinner. He said, you believe Christ could save sinners? I said, well, I guess he can. He said, you believe he could save you? I said, I don't know. And he said, would you ask him to save you? I said, sure. He said, okay, and he put out his hand. He said, I'll take my hand. And he said, I'm this the best way you know how. I asked the Lord to save you. So I took his hand, and then I bobbed my head, and I, I didn't know how to pray. And I said, well, I don't know how to pray. I know Hail Mary and our Father, but that's all I know. And he said, well, just in your own words. So I bobbed my head, and I said, Lord, I'm a blankety-blank sinner, and I'm going to hell sure as blankety-blank if something's going to happen pretty blankety-blank soon, you know. I just cussed all through that prayer. <laughs> and God... Um, you know, you get used to talking like that. You just, you know, you don't know what you're doing. And I got down that thing, you know, and said to save my soul, amen. And I looked up at him. He was smiling. I said, what you laughing at? And he said, uh, did you mean that prayer? I said, you blankety blank right I meant it. <laughs> and I did. I really did, you know. I did. But, you know, you train guys in the hand-to-hand -hand infantry for four years. You don't talk like a Girl Scout master, you know. And I said, you blankety blank right I meant it. And he said, well, if you meant it, you're saved. And I said, I don't feel any different. He said, you're not supposed to feel any different. And I said, well, how do I know I'm saved? He said, you just know. And I said, no, I don't. <laughs> he said, yes, you do. I said, I do not. <laughs> he said, you do. So I said, I don't either. It was getting kind of thick, you know. <laughs> and he pulled out that Bible again and showed me 1 John 5, 13. And he says, now, do you think God's a liar? I said, no, 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 I don't think that. <laughs> and he said, well, God said there you're saved. Now, are you saved or are you not? And boy, he had me between a rock and a hard place, brother. And I read that thing and I said, well, yeah, I guess I'm saved. He said, what do you mean guess? What does it say? <laughs> and I read it and said, these things were written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know you have eternal life. God says, yeah, you know it. I do you know it, don't you? And I said, well... Yeah, <laughs> but I felt like I was lying, and then about a week later, I went out to that church to make a public profession that I knew what happened. Now, you know what happened? First thing of all, the Holy Spirit came in there, and when the Holy Spirit came there, he bought a knife with him, and the first thing he did was take old Pete Ruckman and cut him loose from his body, Amen. set him free. I'm free. If the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Did you ever hear Christian kids at a youth camp saying, I'm from sin set, you're from sin set, we're all from sin set free. And while they're singing, they're all kind of red in the face, you know, because they're thinking about the devil that they've been up to, and they don't believe what they're saying. Well, regardless of how much devil you're up to, when you got saved, there's a sense in which you were set free right then. Because the Holy Spirit cuts your soul loose, and your soul is now no longer stuck to your body. You don't have to serve sin. You're cut loose from it, like the ice cubes in the tray. You know what God did? He reached down there and made an operation under the skin. About in the last 10 years, they got that thing worked out with a laser beam and began to cut under the skin. They catch up with the Bible once in a while, but not very often. <laughs> um, you can always count the King James Bible being 100 to 400 years ahead of anybody, any time, any place, anywhere. Cut me loose. Cut me loose. What happened then? 
the Holy Spirit came in there and regenerated my dead spirit and quickened my spirit and gave me a new spirit. Now I'm a complete man. I've got a live body and a live soul and a live spirit. Then what did he do? He took that spirit and joined that spirit to Christ. He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. We are flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone. Now Jesus Christ came in to indwell me and put me in him, and he came in me. I'm adopted, I'm sanctified, I'm justified, I'm regenerated, I'm redeemed, and I have God's righteousness given to me for nothing. Boy, I, I'm an important person, you know that? <laughs> I know where I've been, I know where I'm going, and I know what I'm doing here. I hear young people say, well, if we just need to get oriented. I'm oriented. My life goes clean back before Genesis 1. And my life goes clear up beyond Revelation 22. And I'm here in a stream of eternal life that comes all the way there and all the way through here and all the way out in eternity. I have eternal life. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You want to live forever? It's easy. Look at here. If I'm in him, then I'm there. He was there. If I'm in him, I'm there. He was there. I've got three lives. As far as my old fleshy body is concerned, my daily life, I am crucified with Christ. And I don't mean have been like the new Aris tense Bibles. I mean present tense, I am crucified with Christ. I protest by your rejoicing, I die daily. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affection. Daily, I'm dying a slow death on a cross. As far as God is concerned, I'm already dead. I, he that is dead is freed from sin. Some of you folks have the most skeptical look on your face. Turn to Romans 6. Turn to Romans 6. When you get saved, you're nailed with Christ. You're dead with Christ. You're buried with Christ. You're risen with Christ. Look at Romans chapter 6. and Look down there about verse 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, along through there. Romans chapter 6. Look at that thing along down there about, oh, begin about verse 6. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. I want a verse there that says, He that is dead is freed from sin. Where is that? 7, verse 7. A dead man can't sin. You don't find the folks out in the graveyard having trouble with, with uh, bikinis and cigarettes and bingo parties. He that is dead is freed from sin. I want a verse there that says, Likewise, reckon yourselves and need to be dead unto sin, but alive unto God. What is that? Eleven. Eleven. Look down there, verse eleven. Reckon yourself dead. 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 Why? Because you are. You say, well, look here, Ruckman. I'm walking around. I see I'm alive. I'm not dead, you know. Yeah, but as far as God is concerned, you're dead. You know what our problem is? Our problem is unbelief. The biggest problem you had before you got saved was real simple. You just couldn't believe a dead Jew could get you to heaven. Now, I know what your problem is now after you're saved, and my problem, we simply can't believe we're dead. That flesh says, I'm not dead. Look at me. I say, shut up. The Bible says you're dead. Lie down and quit complaining. <laughs> And it says, well, I wouldn't be moving if I was dead, would I? And I say, you may be moving, but that's the spasm of a headless chicken. The Bible says you're dead. And that hand says, well, if I'm dead, what you talking to me for? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that, yeah. Uh, honest and honest. Did you ever hear a fellow say, well, his own worst enemy is himself? That's true of anybody. That isn't true of just any person. You know the worst problem I got? It's right here. The biggest problem I got is Peter S. Ruckman. S means say. Peter say Ruckman. <laughs> the, the problem I have is this thing right here. If I could just get rid of this bird to have it made. He always wants something. You folks that have children. Haven't you watched your children? I'm hot. I'm cold. I'm tired. When the service over, I gotta go to the bathroom. When do we stop? When do we go to bed? I don't want to go to bed. I'm hungry. I got a headache. My feet hurt. My hands hurt. 
Uh, that, that's the flesh. When people aren't grown up, they're like that. I want this. I want that. I got to, that's our flesh. Our flesh is always hollering for something. I get so tired of it. I get so wore out with it. I tell you, man, I, I, I love you people, but I get sick of you. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, really, I love the work for the Lord. I get tired of chalk all over me day and night. I get tired of my wife. I get tired of my kids. I get tired of myself. I enjoy living the times in my life when I just, I just want to seek God. I get, I get tired of airports, suitcases, and clothes, all this junk. I mean, just it's always just some junk, 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 junk. I just like to see somebody that never wears out and is perfect and is a friend of mine. I'd like to see him. Flesh, always oh, got to have this. Shut up. <laughs> I was I was I was going down the I was going down the road one day in the car to some law court. Somebody sued me for something. They always are. I must I've been in court so much I ought to be an attorney. I've been taken to circuit court six times, Supreme Court Alabama twice by various spirit filled, soul winning, independent, Bible believing fundamentalists and this and that. They never want a case on me yet, probably never will, but it's a lot of waste of time and money. And I was going down the road in that car thinking what I was going to say to that judge. And you know it never works out like you think it's going to. I don't care how you prepare for court, it's never like you think it is. So you're just wasting your time worrying about it, see. And I was driving on that car, you know, stewing around what I was going to say, and I pretty soon I just stopped that car in the middle of the road. I was out on the highway called Gateswood Highway, it's just a deer track, <laughs> out there, Gateswood between Baymanette and Pensacola, and I stopped that car and got out, and I literally kicked myself around that car. <laughs> I mean, I said, will you shut up? Will you shut up? <laughs> I mean, your bills are paid, you got food in your belly, you got money in the bank, you're in good health, you got a place to preach, all your kids are saved and in good health. Shut up! I get tired of that stuff. That old self, I don't care how hard you try to crucify yourself, you always got one hand free to swing the hammer, you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, self is always there somewhere to come, to come in. I like what old Jonathan Edwards said. He said, when I pray, I sin. When I preach, I sin. My very repentance needs to be repented of, and my tears need washing in the blood of Christ. Amen. It's just too much self. Oh, that flesh. Oh, that flesh. What a strut. What a strut. Worm food. That's all it is. It's worm food. Did you ever see him down at the spa? You know. Some of those guys, listen, some of those guys, some of those guys down there spend more time looking in the mirror than they do pumping iron, you know that? All that stuff come down there. You know, Mr. Universe, Mr. America, that Brigger, Bragger, Brugger, Brogger, whatever his name is. Why, he looks like a clown, man, looks like a freak. <laughs> Body so overdeveloped. Fuck, can't even tie his tie. <laughs> Get your arms in. <laughs> oh, land, man. All that I, I've often thought about that. All they're doing is just displaying a carcass going to go to a hole in the ground. Gee, what a body. He'll make good fertilizer. <laughs> Push up the daisies, man. And you know, in these, in these beauty contests, you know, Miss America, you know, and Miss Dakota, and, and Miss Philippines, you know. <laughs> and now, Miss Maggot. <laughs> That's what it is, brother. All flesh is grass. Take your Bible and turn to Ephesians 4. I'll show you something else about this new life. Ephesians chapter 4. You know every Christian is a walking zombie? Every Christian is a living dead man. And if you want to know why you scare folks so bad, is you're a strange person if you're saved. Because part of you is alive and part of you is dead. Now, before you were saved, you had a live body and a live soul and a dead spirit. Now, you've got a live spirit and you've got a live soul, and so help me, you've got a dead body. <laughs> it's nailed to the cross. It's dead. Bob Jones Sr. used to say, every hour you spend waiting on yourself is Aaron Boy service done for a corpse. That's profound. That means all the effort you spend on self is wasted effort because it's done for a corpse. 
Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. What right, Ephesians chapter 4, 19. Ephesians uh, 5, 5, 14, excuse me. Ephesians 5, 14. Ephesians 5, 14. <clears throat> Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Now you'd think that was to an unsaved fellow. Do you look at the verse before and look at the verse after? It isn't written to an unsaved fellow, it's written to a saved fellow. You know what the trouble is? A bunch of Christians, their life is down here. First part of your life. You're crucified with Christ. Second part of life, you're dead. Third part, risen to walk in newness of life. You know what trouble with most Christians is? They haven't risen from the tomb yet to walk in newness of life. They're down there having fellowship with that corpse. Awake and rise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Uh, hanging around with a dead man. Years ago, an old wine, I went through a graveyard back in the 1900s when they had grave diggers with shovels, and he went through there with about three sheets in the wind, two blown away, and it was midnight. And there was an open grave there, some grave digger had fall into, and couldn't get out. His shovel was up on top, and he's down there about eight feet and couldn't get out. And he was walking up and down that graveyard in the middle of a winter night trying to keep warm until the, grave, the burial party came the next morning, and he was beating his body and, you know, trying to keep warm, and that wine all hurt him. And that old sneaky Pete came staggering onto that graveyard in the dark. Couldn't see a thing. You just see this mound earth up here. He looked down that hole, and down that hole he heard somebody saying, it's cold down here. It's cold down here. <laughs> that old one looked at it for a while and finally said, well, no wonder you're cold. You kicked all the dirt off you. <laughs> <laughs> you know why. <laughs> You know why a lot of Christians are cold? They kicked all the dirt off and got on that, with that old corpse down there. All right, now, let's finish it up. Let's take an unsaved man. An unsaved man is born dead in trespass and sin. He's alone in the world without hope and without God. Modern preachers in America today are not giving the people the whole truth on the whole counsel of God about the condition of an unsaved man. You poor people who spend all your time in this charismatic crowd, you ever rely on a bunch of chicken-hearted, white-livered, yellow-bellied people you're hanging out with? They wouldn't dare tell anybody the truth about their true condition. No courage. You know what an unsaved woman is called in the Bible? She's called a pig. Second Peter chapter two twenty two. You know what an unsaved man is called in the Bible? He's called a dog. Second Peter chapter two twenty two. You know what those fine bunch of young people you have out in Rochester, New York, are called outside of Christ? They're called by nature children of wrath. They're called children of disobedience. Ephesians chapter two. You know what the Bible says about you tonight? If you're unsaved, I don't care what your religion is, your sacraments, your mama, your daddy, your prayer, all that junk. That golden rule, ten commandments, says don't waste my time. That Bible says you are alone in the world without hope, without God, and you are an alien from the covenants of God and strangers. Now uh, that isn't complimentary. That doesn't flatter anybody. A fellow said one time, the reason why you're against that book is because it's against you. I had a fellow say one time, the reason why you don't like that book is because it knows all about you and tells it. I know why some of you people don't enjoy reading the Bible. You bet your life I do. I'll tell you something, if I was a lesbian, I wouldn't enjoy reading Romans chapter 1. <laughs> Amen. If I was a fruit, I wouldn't enjoy reading Genesis chapter 19 and 20. Call them gay. Gay. Oh, you old hypocrite. Why don't you call a thing what it is? We had a word for them in the army, but I couldn't repeat it. <laughs> it was composed of two words. It was a very vivid expression. But you take that kind of thing. Why, the four biggest murders in the 20th century were all queers. Jim Jones, Charlie Manson, Carell, that guy up there around Chicago. They were all gay. They're a bunch of bloody, perverted killers. I know why some people don't. If I was a woman stepping out of my husband, I wouldn't appreciate Ezekiel chapter 16, Ezekiel 23. I'd be reading Psalm 23, you know, the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah. 
If I was an atheist, I wouldn't get a blessing out of Psalm 19. If I was a money-grubbing grabber like some of you money hogs are, I wouldn't appreciate Luke chapter 12. Get mighty quiet in there, preacher. <laughs> All right, an unsaved fellow is lost. He's dead in trespass and sin. He's alone in the world without hope, without God. All right, here he is. What happens to him? Well, he comes in, and he has no light in him. The lights are out. He's alone in the world without hope, without God. It's a shame, but many of the finest people in the world are unsaved people. There are unsaved people in this world who are generous, they're kind, they're thankful, they're hardworking, they're frugal, they're hospitable, they're polite, and they're lost, and they're dead, and they're going to hell. What happens to him? Well, he dies in his sins. Now, I'm not too sure about everything I'm getting ready to show you and tell you. And because I'm not too sure about it, I don't teach it as absolute fundamental Bible doctrine but uh, there surely is something to it. Take your Bible and get Psalm 22 in one hand, get John chapter 3 in the other. The Bible says, What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What's the soul? The soul is a bodily shape. The soul is a bodily shape. Psalm 22, John 3, verse 14. Psalm 22, John 3, verse 14. All right, John chapter 3. John chapter 3, verse 14. John 3, 14. For as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Whosoever believeth on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. What's the serpent a type of? He's a type of the devil. The serpent was more subtle than least the view which the Lord God had made. In some peculiar way, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, and the mystery is too deep for man to fathom, God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the rights of God in him. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, be made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. So when he hangs, he likens himself to a serpent, the personification of the devil. We die on the cross. Psalm 22. Psalm 22, look at the first verse. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's a crucifixion psalm. If you doubted it, you wouldn't doubt it when you got down there about verse 11, 12, 13, 14. Don't those verses say, They parted my garments among them and cast lots for my vesture? Where is that? 18, verse 18. See that thing? Doesn't it say, They pierced my hands and my feet? Where is that? 16, verse 16. It's on the crucifixion. Look at Psalm 22, 6. But I am a worm, W-R-M. I'm a worm, he says. Isn't that strange? That's God's seed. And he likens himself to the seed of the serpent. It seems to me, if I remember my biology right, that seed looks kind of like that. Spermatozoa, isn't that it? You know what Darwin said? <coughs> Darwin said, you're an amoeba, and then you're a planaria or a hydra, a paramecium, you turn into jellyfish, and then you turn into fish, and then you came up on the shore, caught the porpoise backslid, <laughs> went back in. The other one stayed on up. <laughs> and then your tail got shorter and shorter, you stood up in your hind legs, and pretty soon you came here to school. <laughs> <laughs> Once there was a tadpole when I began to begin, then was a frog with my tail tucked in, next there was a monkey in a banyan tree, and now I'm a doctor with a PhD. <laughs> <laughs> and so he said, he come up like that. And when somebody said, how do you do that? Darwin said, well, it's vestigial organs. And they said, uh, would you, you snow again? I didn't get the drift. <laughs> and he said, it's vestigial organs. You got the little marks on you that are remnants of what you used to be when you were an animal. I'll, I'll give you a soul-shattering thought. Suppose those marks on you are not 
remnants of what you were, but prophecy is what you're going to be. Suppose it was in reverse. I'm in the Bible, man begins at the top and goes all the way to the bottom. In Darwin, he begins at the bottom and goes all the way to the top. All right, now I'll take your Bible and uh, turn to Isaiah chapter 34. Get that in one hand. <laughs> Isaiah 34 in one hand. Get Revelation chapter 9 in the other. But nothing like a Bible to clear up a National Geographic. <laughs> Revelation chapter 9, Isaiah chapter 34. Do you realize what you've got in your hand there? You talk about a bomb, man. You talk about an atom bomb. You talk about something. You know what Pinkovich said about that book, Professor Pinkovich of the USSR Soviet Republic's Bureau of Education? You know what he said in 1940? He said, the world is getting too small for that book. Either that book will have to go or the world will have to go. Amen. Amen. I can tell you which one's going. <laughs> goodbye, world, goodbye. <laughs> you know, Edison said, Edison said, Haley's Comet coming, it's going to... And somebody told Edison, they said, Haley's Comet coming, it's going to blow the world to smithereens. Edison said, that's all right, we can do without it. One of these fellows said, a Christian one time, he said, the atom bomb's going to blow us all to hell. He said, correction, it's going to blow you to hell, it's going to blow me to heaven. <laughs> I'm not worried about the world exploding in a nuclear holocaust. I'm not worried about that. That's the least of my problems, brother. I'm an absent the body, present with the Lord. I mean, the sooner the better. <laughs> Okay, you take Revelation chapter 9, Isaiah 34. Now in Isaiah 34, begin there along about, uh, oh, about verse 9, and read slowly and carefully through down verse 16. Isaiah 34, 9 to 16. I'll give you time to read it. Isaiah 34, 9 to 16. burning fire there that won't be quenched? The lamb become burning pritch and, brim, pritch and brimstone, so that stuff? Or right, you get on that lake of fire and the animals in that lake of fire? A bunch of birds. Cormoran, screech owl, bittern. Unclean birds, Leviticus 11, a type of unclean spirits. You find that in Revelation chapter 18, Mark chapter 3, and Ecclesiastes chapter 10, and about 12 other places. But there's something wrong. If you look down that thing carefully, there's some kind of a peculiar animal down there, isn't there? Is there a satyr in there? S-A-T-Y-R. What verse is that? 14. You know what a satyr is? Why, it's half goat and half man. You'd think the Bible writers wouldn't be superstitious enough to put a thing like that in there, wouldn't you? So if you have any Bible but a King James Bible, the word isn't there. The new Schofield Board of Editors. Oh, good, godly, dedicated, premillennial, independent, fundamental people. They don't believe the Bible. So they took it out. It isn't in the new Schofield Bible. That thing's half man, half animal. You know what a centaur is? It's half horse and half man. You know the happy little monster family. Surely this generation I'm talking to knows all about monsters. Surely. I mean, surely some of you went to Star Wars. I didn't go. I missed the hit of the century. <laughs> <laughs> I missed Jaws, too. <laughs> And the exorcist, my, what I've missed, a bunch of mechanical dummies. <laughs> and, and in Star Wars, here's this guy walking along like this, and then right behind this guy walking along like this is an animal that walks and talks just like a man. And then right behind him is a machine that walks and talks like a man. And then right behind that machine is a machine that looks like a machine. You know, it's almost like somebody been fooling with the genes and chromosomes out at the University of, say, New York <laughs> or Ohio and been fooling out with DRA and RNA and the molecules and the amino acids, you know, and the protein building blocks and just got a little thing going there where they could reproduce half machine, half monster, and half man. Well, if they did, they'd have to catch up with the King James turn to Revelation 9. 
The King James always runs 300 years ahead of anybody, anytime, any place, anywhere. That means every science professor and every laboratory in the world. No use to back out. That book is capable of judging any Hebrew or Greek professor anywhere on the face of this earth. All right, Revelation chapter 9, begin at verse 7. I'll give you time to read it. I saw that book, you didn't know, let, it, let a man ask wisdom if he lacks wisdom. Let him ask God, the God that wrote that book, and give you the rest. All right, Revelation 9, verse 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Something came out of that pit. It was like a locust. But aren't those the strangest locusts you ever saw? They got face like what? Face like what? And hair like what? What? Did you ever see him with a face like a man and hair like a woman? <laughs> you surely haven't seen anything like that, have you? You know where they came from? They came from the bottomless pit. <laughs> Look at verse 8, 9, and 10. And they had teeth or mouths like lions and tail. Why, those things are mongrels. They're mutations. They're monsters. Where have they come from? They don't come from outer space. They come from under your feet, but down there. Now, I don't understand, like I said, everything I'm getting ready to say, but there's enough of it there where it begins to give you a picture. Turn to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, verse 44, 46, 48. Mark 9, verse 44, 46, 48. If you have a King James Bible, if you have any other Bible, it's missing twice. I'm today, the, the, the main organ through which Satan works is the body of Christ. Mark chapter 9, verse 44, 46, 48. Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Listen, he didn't say where the worm dieth not. There, there. A personal possessive, personal pronoun. There, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Seems to me I remember little children using that expression in a vulgar sense when I was a young man coming up. There's something wrong with your seed. Now, wouldn't it be something if when that thing is all over, there you are out in hell, and you've lost your soul? What's your soul? It's your bodily shape. What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? You wind up no hands, no feet, no legs, hermaphrodite, boy. Plenty of equality there. Just a big pile crawling all over each other like that. Body like my Lord and Master. You know what kind you'll probably get? If your father the devil us, your father you will do. I don't know that for sure. But I'll tell you one thing, boys and girls, I'm not taking any chances. If that's true, I'm not going to live to find out if it's so in regards to me. I'm getting my salvation right here. Amen. One verse, and I'll let you go. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish. Perish. That's quite a word. Perish. But have everlasting life. Amen. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, bless the invitation tonight. I pray if there's anybody here on the save tonight, they'll come and trust the Lord Jesus Christ and not take a chance for their soul, the most valuable thing they have. You said it was the most valuable thing we have on this earth. You said if we get the whole world lose our own soul, it wouldn't profit us anything. There are people right in hell right now that give, that give the whole world just to come back and get in this building. They're the destroyed spirits of millions in hell right now that would give the whole world, the whole universe, for just one chance 
to trust Christ the Savior. And it's too late now. They don't have any blood in them anymore. The blood's gone. And you became partaker of flesh and blood to die for bloody men. And you died a bloody death for bloody sinners. And these people here I'm talking to still have blood in them. And they can respond. They can react. Lord, I pray the Holy Spirit will show them without shedding of blood there's no remission. May they trust your risen Savior as their Savior this night. For Jesus' sake, amen. Amen. Let's stand. Let's stand, folks, and let's sing just I am without one plea. But that thy blood was shed for me, and that thy bids me come to the old Lamb of God I come. Brother, lead us. Just as I am without but but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bids me come to the old Lamb of God I come, I come. Just as I am. Sometimes I think we get talking about these things, saying about these things, we get the wrong idea about it. Sometimes we get the idea, you know, this is some preacher's preacher about to make a living, you know, or some people talk about that you can believe or not believe or accept or not accept. This thing here is universal. It's tragic. It's dramatic. It's the most powerful, horrible, terrible thing in the whole history of the universe. That thing right there. I thought of dying going to hell. I don't know whether they're decomposing down there right now or not, or whether that starts in the tribulation or what. But I bet you at the white throne judgment, the final metamorphosis takes place. At the white throne judgment, the old boy loses his soul. He loses his soul. I, I don't know if I even want to see that, but I'll be there to see it. I'd, I'd, hate, I'd hate to think about a stamp there and seeing my mother and daddy show up there. But as far as I know, they die without Christ, and they'll show up. I hate to think about any of you standing there. I'd sure hate to get up there and look down and see some of the face popping up there I've been looking at all this week, or maybe one or two nights, or some of you visitors back here in the corners. You know, kind of slipping in there to see what's going on. Why don't you get saved? Amen. There are saved people all over this building. I know some of them are pretty sorry. You can't tell us that. You can't tell us preacher anything we don't know about the sheep. We know the flock. But they're saved. Anything is better than going to hell, man. Anything is better than going to hell. Don't you go to hell. Don't you go to hell. You don't have to go to hell. Blessing just as I am. The gift of God. Listen, the gift, the gift, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If I knock at your door tomorrow night and came over there and asked for a drink of water or to use your telephone, would you invite me in? I mean, most people would. If somebody came up to your door at night in a suit like this and I'm having car trouble out there, could I please use your telephone for a minute? Most of you people would let them in. Jesus Christ knocks at the door. You going to let him in? Let's say, brother, lead us. Just as I am, so tossed about with many a conflict, many a doubt, I keep that fears within, without a lamp of God I come, I come. Oh, I'd like to have us bow our heads and pray now a little while, and then we're going to sing one more stanza, and then we're going to close. Maybe we went along here 10, 15 to stand, there's somebody to finally make a move, but I, I just don't believe that, that any pressure like that's going to do you any good. Let's pray a while. If you're a Christian, you pray for any unsaved here tonight. I don't know unsaved people here tonight, but in a crowd this big, they're bound to be four or five, maybe six or seven. Now let's pray a while. You pray for them. I can't save them. In the church in the world, I can save them. The Lord Jesus Christ has to save them. You pray for them. 
Some of you folks down here tonight have never walked down an aisle in your life and publicly confessed Jesus Christ your Savior. You never have. That's why some of you doubt your salvation. You've never taken a public stand. You ought to do it tonight. Maybe some of you really did get saved somewhere out in the bushes someplace or artillery bombardment. There are all kinds of places where men get a hold of God. But you're not going to know you have eternal life till you confess him publicly. you got a chance tonight. you got a chance. And some of you haven't even received it. You're messing around with sacraments, religions, reading a bunch of junk, watching a bunch of junk, and you don't have any personal salvation in your soul. You don't have any new life in you. There's no new spirit in you. You're the same old boy that Mama raised. And there's been a change in your life. And tonight ought to be a change. Don't take a chance with it. You probably outlive me, but maybe you won't. Maybe some some preacher be preaching your funeral for this month's over. Now don't don't put it off. Father, bless this last stanza and speak to somebody here tonight that you've probably spoken to before. Maybe you're speaking to right now about these matters. And I pray if there's an unsaved person here tonight that has never been saved, they'll come on this invitation and, and let one of these young men lead them to Christ and show them how to be saved. And I pray if there's any hidden disciples here tonight, you'll flush them out and they'll step out and not be ashamed to confess the Lord Jesus Christ, their Savior. And I ask it in his name. Amen. Amen. Let's sing one more stand to come while we sing. Just as come on. I am come on. The Lord deal with you. Come. It's the last chance. Come on. Come the best way you know how. service in just a moment, but you need to ask yourself this question before you go. Which one are you? Are you here, or are you here? If your spirit's been quickened and made alive, you're here. If you haven't allowed Jesus Christ to do that, you're here. Very simple. Churches don't quicken spirits. Priests don't quicken spirits. Ministers don't quicken spirits. Preachers don't quicken spirits. Sacraments, religions don't quicken spirits. And if you believe that, you don't know one thing about the Bible. Not one thing. Ephesians chapter 2 makes it very clear. Jesus Christ quicken spirits and he does it with a two edged sword called the word the psalmist said my soul cleaveth to the dust quicken thou me according to thy word we want you to get saved we want you to realize that Jesus Christ can save you I feel compelled for us to sing just one more verse. And here's what we're asking you to do. If you're not sure that your spirit's been quickened, been made alive by Jesus Christ, and for all you know, you are occupied within with a dead spirit, then on this verse, step out of your seat wherever you are and make your way down one of these aisles. One of these folk will greet you with an open Bible and show you from God's Word how you can be saved and have absolute assurance you're saved. Let's sing, and you come. Just as I am without one plea, but that my blood was shed for me, and that the wish become to thee, O man of God, I come. Let's sing another verse. Your instruments just play. Instruments play. Someone's coming. And while they play, perhaps you need to come. If you do, then do it. 
Simple. If you need to come, then do it. got a good bit of doctrine tonight. You know, folks, I never really understood. I, I believed it. I believed it because I, I had fragments. I believed the, in, in eternal security from the day I got saved. And uh, the reasons I was given for eternal security were certainly enough to make me believe it. John chapter 10 and Romans chapter 8 and 1 John chapter 5 and, you know. But I never understood eternal security till I understood the doctrine of spiritual circumcision. I believed it, but I never understood it. And when I got a hold of that, boy, that made a difference. That's why at First Bible Baptist Church, and even our follow-up material, when we teach eternal security, we teach the doctrine of spiritual circumcision. We teach folks exactly what happened to them when they got saved. I was just getting ready to leave the office this afternoon, and, and evidently no one was around, and I, the phone rang, kept ringing, and I don't usually answer the phone. I let one of our secretaries do that. Uh, because uh, they saved me from the nuts, you know. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> kept ringing, so I picked it up and answered the phone. Some young, tender, sweet voice said, uh, I'd like to speak to someone about a meeting we're going to have over here. I said, there are such and such. I said, fine, tell me about it. She said, well, we're just a fellowship of believers, and we're going to have some kind of a missionary meeting, and we're just going to sit down and talk to one another about some things. And we're not going to talk about doctrine. And we're not going to set that aside. We're just going to talk about the Lord. And she said, we'd like to invite you all to come. Boy, did she pick the wrong guy in the wrong week <laughs> to say that to. I'm going to tell you something, folks. If you don't learn some doctrine, you are a dead chicken. You are, brother. You know the tragic truth of it is there are Baptist preachers, the dime a dozen, running all over this country that could be torn to shreds in five, minute by a well, five minutes by a well-educated Mormon J.W. or Campbellite because they don't know anything about the Word of God. Oh, you need to know something about that book. There's more to this business of Christianity than just tear-jerking stories and waving hankies. Amen. More to it than that. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Well, that's it. We're going to do it again tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. Carl Rizzo. Carl has been saved recently. And Carl's coming to make a public profession of his faith and trust in Jesus Christ. God bless you, Carl. Carl, to, you asked Jesus Christ to be your Savior. You didn't ask anything or anyone else. Is that right? And you can believe that he did just that. And all the people said? Amen. 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 All right. Good. Well, let's pray and be back in the morning, shall we? Brother Dave Dunbar, pray for us, please.